Thanks for coming. Um, what I want to talk to you about tonight is a research project that I've been doing with my undergraduate students for about the last eight years at UWGB. Uh, and this is something that we just kind of wrapped up, at least the initial phase of it, though we're still going to keep working on some other things. And I'll start with this guy, uh, Alexander the Great, someone you've probably all heard of. Uh, Alexander is notable or famous for having conquered in a very short time uh, most of the then known world. And uh, despite his success and despite his fame as one of the great conquerors, one of the great generals of all time, uh, there's quite a few things about Alexander from a military standpoint that remain somewhat mysterious. And one of these is the type of armor which his men and he himself wore. Now, when you think of armor in the ancient Greek or Macedonian world, probably what comes to your mind is something like this. So men encased in bronze, uh, with helmets, greaves, big shields, all that stuff. And there is certainly truth to this. I mean, this is a standard type of armor that was used by the Greeks. But it looks also as if uh, the Greeks, the Macedonians, the Romans, the Egyptians, the Persians, many other groups in the ancient world also at times used another type of armor, which was made of nothing but fabric, probably linen, and glue. And the term for this is a linothorax. Uh, this literally means a linen chest or, or linen body armor. And there are a number of references and a number of visual images, I'll talk about these in a little more detail later, uh, that suggest that this was something that was widely used in the ancient world. The problem with this is that no examples have survived. So because they're made of organic materials, cloth and glue, they simply don't show up in the archeological record. Archaeologists like to study stuff that survives. And so the line of thorax has pretty much been ignored in scholarship. So here's the mystery. Uh, we have this thing which they talk about in the sources. They show images of it on bases. But people have pretty much ignored it up to this point. Um, so one big problem with this is no examples are extant. A second problem with the line of thorax is that I think there has been a certain kind of uh, suspicion among modern scholars and just people interested in history that anything made out of just fabric and glue could really have been decent armor. So there's been a kind of suspicion or reluctance to accept this as legitimate protection. Uh, sometimes when it gets mentioned by scholars, they sort of dismiss it. They say, well, this was just second class armor. If you couldn't afford proper bronze armor, you, you would wear one of these things, maybe. So. Uh, that's the second kind of thing that has caused this to languish in obscurity. Uh, this is where we come in. Uh, the UWGB Line of Thorax Project, as it's become known, is this uh, ongoing, multi-year uh, student-faculty collaboration whose goals are, first of all, to attempt to reconstruct, uh, using only the materials that would have been available in the ancient world, actual examples of this sort of armor. And then secondly, once we've reconstructed some examples, to test it in a rigorously scientific fashion to determine would this have actually been decent protection or not. So that was the two goals of our project. Uh, here's the first group of students that I started in with this. Uh, this thing just ballooned like crazy, eventually involved hundreds of students, uh, various other faculty involved, members of the community. We got all these local weavers involved. We had bow hunters shooting things for us. Uh, it went crazy but it started out very humbly. Uh, we ended up reconstructing uh, six, maybe seven, uh, full-scale examples of this armor. So here you can see four of my students wearing some of these uh, suits of armor. Uh, we also conducted a bunch of tests, and I'll talk about that later. To give credit where credit is due, this project started with one of my undergraduate students, a guy named Scott Bartell. And Scott was someone who, for whatever reason, got totally obsessed with Alexander the Great. Uh, he has an Alexander tattoo, he just he loves Alexander. And one summer he decided that he would try to construct for himself a copy of this type of armor that Alexander is shown wearing in a very famous mosaic. Uh, this is one of these line of thorax things. And so he did this in his basement, he just went to the fabric store, got some stuff put together, and he brought it to me and said, you know, Professor Aldrete, can you look at this and tell me, is this historically accurate? And very confidently I said, well, I'll give you some nice articles on this and you can, you know, see the research and do this. Well, I went and looked for the articles and they didn't exist. So uh, 
uh, rather embarrassingly had to come back and say, well, apparently nobody knows exactly how this thing worked. But I said, but we can figure it out ourselves. So he and I started then on this project, and the whole thing kind of snowballed from there. Um, as I say, it grew to involve lots of students, lots of different projects, all sorts of things, various side tangents. Here's some of the students involved. All right, how do we know about the line of thorax? Well, there's two main sources of information. There's mentions or descriptions of this kind of armor in ancient literature written by ancient authors. And the earliest of these is right there at the beginning of Greek literature. It shows up twice in Homer's Iliad. So there's two uses of this word line of thorax to describe armor uh, being worn by Greeks who are mentioned in the ship list. So if you, those of you who read Homer know there's this long list of uh, warriors and ships who take part in the Trojan War. Uh, two of these groups are described as wearing a line of thorax. We have also then searched very exhaustively through lots of different ancient authors. And up to this point in time, we have found 65 other uh, explicit literary references to linen armor. And this includes both times when authors actually use the term line of thorax and other examples where they simply mention armor that was made out of linen. Uh, this comes from 40 different ancient authors. Uh, among these are many of the most famous ones. Um, Homer, uh, Strabo, Pliny the Younger, Cassius Dio, Livy. Um, there's a couple in Herodotus. Um, there's one in some of the Greek playwrights mentioned this. So lots of different people refer to this armor. One of the really interesting things, once we had amassed this set of literary references, was just how widespread, both in terms of chronology of time and different cultures that are attested as having used linen armor. Uh, just to kind of give you a quick survey, some of the key civilizations that are said to have used this sort of armor include the Egyptians, the Persians, the uh, Phoenicians, the Macedonians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Etruscans, and various Spanish tribes. So you can see they pretty much span uh, the entire Mediterranean basin. And in terms of chronology, they cover about a 1,500 year period. So this technology, if you will, is something that was used by a lot of different people over a very long period of time. Linen, of course, comes from the flax plant. Uh, flax was grown across the Mediterranean basin. Uh, today, people often think of it as sort of a plant that comes from Egypt or some other areas. And those areas do grow very fine linen. And they did in antiquity. But sort of ordinary linen, coarser linen, coarser uh, from the flax plant was grown everywhere across the Mediterranean basin, uh, even in places you might not expect it, like Germany. So even getting quite far north. Uh, flax is an interesting plant. Uh, it'll grow in certain soils that are unsuitable for other kinds of agriculture. You can grow it at fairly high altitudes. You can grow it on slopes that are rocky. So it's a nice plant to supplement other things. And this is one of the reasons why people did uh, plant flax and turn it into linen. Linen uh, is well known as it's one of the oldest fabrics that human beings used. Uh, there are finds from Anatolia that go back 7,000 years. So this is one of the very first uh, plants that was cultivated, one of the first fabrics that human beings made. Um, linen also has a number of interesting properties. Uh, it has a very high tensile strength. Uh, it actually gets stronger when it gets wet, which is a nice thing for armor. If you happen to be fighting at sea or something, your armor gets better if you get soggy. Um, and it it's also uh, has some other, it cleans very easily. It has some other properties. It stays cool in the sun. And of course, the Mediterranean can be a very hot place. Uh, we know that ancient people used linen for all kinds of things. Again, the most famous uses are fancy clothing. Uh, you have a lot of priests dress in linen. They would use linen to wrap mummies, things like that. But there's also very, a lot of very humble uses attested from the ancient world. People made fishing nets out of it. Uh, they made blankets. They made tablecloths. Um, so it was something that was very widely uh, cultivated all across the Mediterranean. Even little family farms would have probably grown a little bit of flax to turn into linen to use on their farm. Our second type of source material we had to deal with or had that we could draw upon was visual evidence. And here we had pictures of this sort of armor uh, on, in various forms of ancient art. Uh, we spent a lot of time, again, searching for all of these various forms of art and trying to find as many illustrations of this armor as we could. 
And scholars who like to make up typologies uh, technically refer to this style of armor when it shows up in art as type 4 armor. So that's just the term. We ultimately identified 910, that number's always changing, so we're always finding new ones, but so far we have 910 images of this armor that we found in various forms of ancient Greek art. Uh, they appear on 486 objects. Most of these date from 600 BC to the first century BC. So this is uh, one of the actual big things we did in terms of scholarship, was we simply put together this database of images of this type of armor. And this was, um, uh, my wife actually did a lot of this stuff. Uh, we did things like looking through uh, the museum catalogs, and there's this publication called the Corpus Visorum Antiquorum, which is a, uh, a collection of about 250 giant-sized volumes showing every Greek vase that's ever been found that's in any museum anywhere in the world. And my wife flipped through all 250 volumes page by page, uh, finding every example of this armor. So uh, the librarians did not like her because they had to reshelve all these things. But uh, we, we've put together this huge database, and this was one of our main sources of information when it came to reconstructing this armor. Just to uh, give you an idea of some of the stuff we, uh, we looked at, uh, 96 of our images are from Greek vases in a style known as black figure vase. This is a relatively early style Greek vase painting. Uh, 12 come from these white ground technique vases. Uh, these are usually little uh, vases put on uh, at, um, grave sites as funerary offerings. Um, the biggest, single biggest category was red figure vases, uh, 464 images. That's over half of our total. Um, this is the most common kind of uh, Greek vase painting. This is the style you'd get in the classical area, era of 5th century Athens. If you go to a museum, you'll see a lot of these red figure vases. We also have 166 images from various uh, sculpture, whether out of stone or terracotta. Uh, very helpful to us were 27 paintings from the ancient world. These were either in tombs or on sarcophagi. And these were helpful because they gave us some hint as to the original colors that were used in some of this armor. Uh, we also have 158 images on bronze, uh, a few on gold as well. Of these, the single most famous is this thing which is called the Alexander Mosaic. Uh, it's actually a Roman copy of a Greek original that survives. Uh, it was uh, in um, Pompeii and is now in the uh, museum in Naples. So if you go to the, the big National Archaeology Museum in Naples in Italy, you'll see this thing. But here's Alexander himself on his horse, uh, riding in, wearing what is usually identified as a line of thorax. And this, by the way, was the image that inspired uh, my student Scott to start this whole thing. So this is one of the most famous images of Alexander. So putting together the literary stuff and those visual images, what we then did, ne did next was to try to uh, backwards engineer, to say if it ends up looking like this, what does it have to start out as? And so we put a lot of effort into coming up with a pattern for this armor. And the armor is basically made up of two components. You have a long kind of roughly rectangular piece with curvy edges, and this gets wrapped around your body. And then you have a second piece with these two long arms that is placed over your shoulders with your neck between those two arms, and you're gonna tie down those arms on your chest. So you would attach the two things together, and then to put it on, you would wrap uh, the rectangular piece around your body, bend it, curve it around your body, and one of the best things we had to work with was there are about 30 images on vases which show Greek warriors in the process of putting on their armor. And so this was particularly useful to us because we could see it in this kind of halfway stage. Here's a guy about to tie the sides together. Usually they're tied together on the left side, which would be protected by your shield. And notice in back he has those two uh, sort of uh, arms sticking up vertically before he grabs them, pulls them down, and ties them across his chest. So here you can see those pulled down, tied on the chest. Also, typically they have these little flaps at the bottom. These are called tarugues. This is to offer some, well, hopeful protection to the thighs and groin area. Uh, and one of the most interesting things about all these images is the way that whatever material this is made out of has two contradictory qualities. It's something that's flexible enough that you can bend it from a flat shape into a tubular shape around your body and bend those things down. But at the same time, it's stiff enough 
that if you just leave them on their own, they stick upright and stay that way. So this is kind of difficult. I mean, this rules out stuff like it can't be metal, it can't be bronze, because it would be stiff, but it wouldn't be flexible. Um, it rules out certain types of leather unless you've treated it properly. That's an odd combination of elements. So there's a lot of debate, or was a lot of debate, what this thing was made out of, but it had to have those two contradictory qualities of being flexible, but also being rigid when in its natural form. We made lots of first paper versions and then cardboard, uh, tried them out on ourselves, until we finally came up with a pattern that when we put it together would replicate what we saw in the images. Uh, this was our, this is actually our very first pattern. Um, and later patterns we came up with were a little bit simplified. But uh, this was the first one, shall show you this one. And you can see it has lots of kind of weird little shapes and tabs, and you might think some of this is just decorative or not really important. Uh, one of the things we discovered is that almost all of these have a very specific practical purpose. Uh, just to give you one example, uh, in red over the circle there's that little tab there on the shoulder piece, and this just looks kind of like a random tab. Well, when you put the whole thing together, it's actually something very important. This is the neck guard. So this protects you from having your head chopped off by someone swinging a, a sword or an axe at it from behind. So on the left, you can see a vase painting with that little tab. On the right, one of our reconstructions. So all of these things serve real purposes. This is very practical armor. When we were going to go about constructing this, uh, we wanted to make it out of materials that were as close as possible to what they had in the ancient world. So we wanted to use glues and fabrics which were similar to that which, let's say, the ancient Greeks would have had. The single biggest challenge, honestly, we faced in this whole thing was getting our hands on authentic linen. Uh, I caution you now, if you go on the internet and search, you know, hand-woven, ancient-style linen, people will sell you stuff, but it's not genuine. Uh, in almost all cases, it's flax that has been processed by machines and then treated with chemicals. So even if it's been spun into thread and woven into fabric by hand, the harvesting and processing was machine done. Eventually, after a lot of searching and a lot of false leads, we identified some women in Wisconsin, of all places, who were growing their own flax, processing it by traditional methods, spinning it into thread, and weaving it into fabric. And so we got our first batch of fabric from them. The downside is, as you can imagine, it's horrifically expensive. It was more than $100 per square yard. Um, this meant that for our tests, uh, which I'll talk about later, we used some of the authentic linen, but to construct some of the replicas where we were just looking at shape and sort of wearability, uh, we cheated and used some partially modern stuff. Later down the road, once this whole thing kind of uh, mushroomed, uh, my university started to grow and manufacture its own linen. So two other professors, a textile professor and a, a professor and a medieval history professor got really interested and started to plant flax, uh, harvest it, process it, spin it into thread, and weave it into linen. So now we kind of have homegrown linen. Uh, just to sort of show you how complex all this is, uh, the basic steps are, of course, you plant it, you harvest it, then you red it, which is you stick it in a sort of pond uh, for a couple months and it rots and smells horrible. Uh, then you dry it out and you get this sort of straw-like fiber. Uh, you then have to uh, break that, so you smash it with this sort of wooden thing which breaks the outer husk and you can extract the fibers inside that. Then you scutch them, which is where you whack it with this wooden thing uh, and draw out the fibers, which once you get the fibers, they look just like hair. So the term, you know, flax and hair comes from the fact that flax really looks just like hair. Then you hackle it, which is the most dangerous thing. Uh, you have to draw it through these big nails, uh, and you need a tetanus shot before you do this. But that's to get all the, uh, the little fragments out. Finally, you spin it, and we actually taught many of our students how to use a drop spindle, uh, which is an interesting technology in and of itself. And then finally you weave it, and you get linen. So uh, this is the whole process just for that. In terms of constructing this, uh, our basic technique was a lamination one. So we'd take uh, a layer of fabric, we would saturate it with glue, use a lot of glue, put another layer on top of that, and press the layers together. 
And we found it's very important to let that, those two layers completely dry before you laminate on a third layer. Uh, when we got greedy and tried to do a bunch of layers at once, we found that our armor grew this nasty mold. So you don't want that. It takes at least 10 hours for each layer to dry. And then you just repeat. You just keep adding layer onto layer until you have it thick enough. In terms of glue, uh, we experimented with a lot of different glues. And one of the problems is we know that in the ancient world they had sort of the equivalent of super glue. They had really powerful, strong bonding glues which would set under water, which were waterproof. The problem is the recipes for that have not survived until today. So we can't replicate this. Uh, so what we ended up doing was going the opposite route. We said, well, if we can't use those sort of super glues, let's pick a glue that we know would have been so cheap and so common and so widespread in the ancient world that everybody would have had access to it. And what we settled on was rabbit glue. So it's a glue made from the skin of rabbits. Uh, rabbits were ubiquitous, they're cheap. You could just grab some rabbits, get their skin, uh, get the sort of layer off the bottom, dry it, and you have a nice glue. It's not the strongest glue, but it works. So we used a lot of rabbit glue. Um, by the way, we didn't have to go killing a bunch of rabbits ourselves. Uh, rabbit glue is still used by some traditional oil painters today. So you can actually buy it in a powdered form that's, that's nice. Uh, here you can see we're melting the glue in a double boiler, applying it with a turkey baster. Um, but notice how saturated the fabric is. I mean, we use a lot of glue on this stuff. And also I want to caution you, if you uh, have a dog and are making something with rabbit glue, <laughs> keep him away from it. Uh, my dog had an unnatural interest in the armor. Uh, clearly from his perspective, what we were doing was making tasty rabbit-flavored chew toys for him. So he kept trying to eat my armor. We also made a glue made from flax seeds. So anywhere that you had the uh, plant to make the fabric, you could also make a decent glue. And again, it's not the strongest glue, but it was good enough. Once you had built up a big slab, so you keep laminating till you get a slab as thick as you want. And we found that about one centimeter was the maximum thickness that would allow you to bend it uh, into a C shape from flat and back again more or less infinitely. So we've had some of this armor eight years now. We've been bending it all the time and it still is, it hasn't fallen apart. If you make it thicker than one centimeter, then you start to have danger sometimes with it cracking. So that seems to have been an, an optimal or maximum thickness. We then trace the patterns onto it and we cut out the slabs. And I say that very glibly, and I'm showing you pictures of the very first one we did. It was not so easy to cut these out. So the first time we did it, we just made the big slab, traced it and tried to cut it with scissors. That didn't work. I got some really big scissors like this. That didn't work. I went to Home Depot and bought some bolt cutters. That didn't work. And finally, we were only able to cut this by using a uh, electric jigsaw equipped with blades made to cut through quarter inch steel. <laughs> so that gives you some idea how tough this was. Now, obviously in the ancient world, they didn't have electric jigsaws with metal cutting blades. And so this is the sort of, this is what experimental archeology span does. It lets you learn obvious things. Uh, from this point on, we realized that of course, what they did in the ancient world was, they cut out each layer of fabric to the right shape and then glued those together. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, and in subsequent versions of the armor, that's how we made it. Uh, but this is how you learn. Uh, you then attach the pieces together. There's various ways you can do this. Uh, attach the teruge, some other little elements. Uh, paint it so it looks pretty. And there you go. You have a finished line of thorax. And the one I've got over here, uh, which I'll let you look at after the lecture, uh, was one of the first sort of authentic ones we made. Uh, this particular one, it has 17 layers. It's about one centimeter thick. Uh, it used a bolt of linen, 53 feet long, three feet wide, and two gallons of glue. So uh, again, uh, you really saturate this. So you're creating something new when you laminate all this together. Here I am trying it on uh, next to a vase painting. So you can see the nice kind of correspondence in terms of shape and form and all this. Uh, here it is, fully put on, uh, and I guess uh, ready for battle. So uh, we have worn these for considerable amounts of time. Uh, not I, but my students have put them on and gone running for four or five miles. 
Um, they we I have worn them all day long for eight or ten hours at a time. So we've gained a lot of experience in terms of the uh, wearability issues uh, and the practicality side of this. Uh, just as an aside, uh, one of the things that we were able to do in terms of research is once we had that big database of visual images, for the very first time we could start to do a kind of statistical analysis of ancient Greek armor. And we could answer a lot of questions definitively that before people had just guessed at. So, for example, uh, if you look in the existing literature, a lot of times they would say, well, they added metal scales to all their armor. Well, when we actually analyzed all the images, it turned out, yes, there are metal scales, but only in 15% of the cases. So that actually turns out to be a rarity, uh, not the standard form. Uh, there were a lot of other little insights. I, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but just to give you some idea of the kinds of stuff. 60% um, of the shoulder flaps are curved versus 40 square. Um, there's a chronological distinction where one style was popular before a certain date, the other style after. Um, the Turugues, again, sometimes you see one layer, sometimes two, and once we analyzed it, it turned out again there's a time, uh, moment in time when they switch from one style to the other. Um, also, the attachment points, there's various styles. Often there's just one point in the center that they tie it to. Sometimes you have two parallel ones at a slightly less uh, common rate. Um, sometimes you have a fancy double over cross point like this. And we could also analyze the designs. So next time you see a movie about ancient Greek warriors and want to know, uh, are they depicting the, the uh, decorations on the armor correctly? Well, now you can check out our book and see. And it turns out that the most common design on ancient Greek armor by far was these little kind of star or sunburst patterns. And even that was only on 17% of them. But that was by far the most common decoration. Uh, certain things which you always see, which we kind of thought would be very common, turned out to be rare. So that Greek key pattern, which you always see all the time in movies, it's always on illustrations, uh, turned out only to be on 4% of the armor. Uh, there's also a, a good number of images of guys on horseback wearing this. So this is something that was used both by foot soldiers, by cavalry. There's also some references to marines on ships wearing this kind of armor. All right, so we had accomplished the first stage. We had reconstructed this armor. We had something that looked like the ancient images. We'd learned a little bit about what it was like to wear it. The second half was, would this have been decent protection? Would this have saved your life on a battlefield? And to do this, we constructed a number of test patches. So we made these sort of two by two squares, and we made them in all kinds of different uh, permutations. So we had different numbers of layers, different fineness of linen. Sometimes we alternated the direction of weave. Um, we tried to test every kind of variable we could think of. Do we have you know, thick thread, thin thread, um, different glues, uh, all sorts of stuff. And then we subjected them to arrow tests. And we focused on testing with arrows for two reasons. Uh, one of them is that this is one of the most common hazards you would have met on the ancient battlefield. And secondly, it was a kind of test that we could scientifically measure exactly every variable. So if we had been hitting it with a sword or something, uh, if we were doing it personally, the strength you hit it with would have varied. But with arrows, we could control the exact force, we could measure it, uh, we could really do truly scientific studies. In terms of our methodology, we would mount the test panel onto a foam block, which simulated a human body, attach this to a heavy wooden stand, we used uh, handmade arrows with natural feather fletching, so of the same size, diameter, weight, characteristics that we know they used in the ancient world. Uh, we had uh, arrowheads cast for us by hand out of iron and bronze. Um, we also used some modern ones. I'll, I'll come back to those. Um, here's some of our more common ones we tested. These are all iron or bronze, which is what they would have made uh, arrowheads out of in the period we're interested in. And just to assure you that our arrowheads really look like ancient ones, in this slide, uh, in each case on the left of each pair is one of our replica uh, arrowheads. And on the right is a photo of an arrowhead that's in the National Museum of Athens that was uncovered on a Greek battlefield. So you can see we really have the exact same shapes, the weights, the sizes, all that kind of thing. Uh, and also the metallurgical content we tried to match. When it came to the bows, though, we did not use or try to use replica bows. Instead, we used modern uh, bows that use a system of weights and pulleys to have an exact hold weight. And we did this because we wanted the same force for every shot. 
So these sort of bowl, bows have a measurable hold weight. You pull the string back to a certain point and you'll have exactly uh, the same amount of force from shot to shot. If we had used, let's say, a wooden bow, uh, you would have a great deal of variability depending on how long the arm or the person pulling it back was, what the humidity was at the time you're doing the test, all kinds of other variables. We did, I have to admit, uh, play around with everything we had. I have an English longbow. We shot it with that. We shot it with anything we could lay our hands on. Um, we did various shoot shots from very close, about 20 uh, feet away, uh, up to a couple hundred feet away, so short range, long distance, even much longer than this. Um, we measured each shot its penetration. We numbered individually every shot and all the associated data. We recorded all the data, and we, ca we tabulated the results. The sort of bottom line test result is that if you were wearing uh, a one centimeter thick line of thorax, you would have been safe from almost any kind of bow or arrow that you would have found on an ancient battlefield between about 600 and 400 BC, so our main time period. So basically this was very, very good protection. Uh, just to give you some idea how much of a difference it makes, uh, when we shot the foam target block with a very weak 25 pound pull bow, that's extremely weak, um, the arrow still penetrated 230 uh, millimeters into the foam block. That would have been like shooting a person who's not wearing armor. That would have killed you. When we put the armor on there, it went only about five millimeters. It didn't even go through the slab. So it's the difference between a fatal hit and no injury whatsoever. Uh, late in the process, uh, we came to the attention of a number of uh, people, History Channel, Discovery Channel, and so on, and they filmed actually three documentaries about us. And what was nice about this is those guys have a lot of money. So they brought some fun toys, which we couldn't afford. Uh, among them was a fancy ballistics gel test dummy. Uh, this is actually a human torso made out of ballistics gel with bones, organs, even blood in it. And so we were able to do some experiments with this. Uh, and I'm happy to say that the results were almost identical to the ones we did with our you know, $20 foam block I bought at Menards. So um, it, it did confirm for us uh, some of the things. Uh, at that point in time, we also got access to things like very high-speed cameras, which let us actually measure the velocity of the arrows in flight, things like this. So uh, that, that helped a lot in sort of uh, solidifying and confirming some of our scientific data. Uh, again, uh, you can see here's a shot just shot into the ballistics gel dummy, uh, how deep that goes. And this isn't even using a powerful bow, but uh, that definitely would have killed you. But when you have the armor on, it protects you quite well. We have about 1,300 test shots in all that all have these variables we recorded for them. Uh, we did a lot of number crunching. Uh, if you like the scientific side of things, to penetrate 10 millimeter slab of this armor requires about 70 joules of energy. Uh, this is a number which lets you compare it to other kinds of armor, so that's why that's significant. Um, we experiment with a lot of different type shots, and one of them was lofted shots, where you kind of shoot the arrow in an upward arc, so not a flat trajectory. And this is actually more like what you would have had on ancient battlefields. So like when you see you know, masses of men just shooting arrows up into the sky, and then they come down on the enemy. And when we did that, uh, the arrows just honestly most of the time bounced off, uh, or they would just stick weakly in. So against the sort of shots that would be most common on a real ancient battlefield, this was terrific protection. Um, another thing we experimented with was most of our tests were at a 90 degree angle with a flat target and an arrow coming in at a flat trajectory. That's really a worst case scenario. That almost never would have happened in reality. In reality, armor is curved, people would be moving, the arrows would be coming in at an angle. And we found that with these uh, laminated fabric slabs, when an arrow came in at an angle, the tip would go through the first couple layers, and then it would kind of catch between two of the middle layers, and those, the layers would almost turn the direction of the arrow away from your body. So the arrow had a natural inclination to kind of burrow between the layers, but that also turned it away from you. So this would have been uh, much better protection in, on a battlefield sort of situation than in our artificial tests, which really represent a worst case scenario. Uh, there were a lot of variables that we thought would matter, which turned out not to matter at all. Uh, one of them was alternating the direction of the weave. That made no difference. 
The number of layers didn't matter either. So if it was one centimeter thick made of five layers was about the same protection as one centimeter thick made of 15 layers. So you could use coarse linen. You didn't have to have the expensive fine stuff. And I think once you laminate it all together and add that glue, it really turns into something new. And so that's why you could use a, a wide variety of things, and that's why the weave didn't make such a difference. Um, different glues didn't make much difference. We used uh, lots of different glues, ancient and modern. We used fish glues. Uh, we used PVC glues. We used Elmer's glue. Uh, we used all kinds of things. Uh, by the way, Elmer's glue is almost identical in performance to rabbit glue. So if you want to make one of these, I'd say leave the rabbits, just go buy a big gallon jug of Elmer's. It'll, it'll be very realistic. What did, what did make a difference was the authentic linen versus the modern machine processed linen. And the authentic linen was about 7 to 12 percent better protection per thickness. And this puzzled us for a while, and finally what we narrowed in on is that when you process this by hand, uh, these waxy pectinous uh, sort of coating gets left on the fibers, and that's something that gets stripped away by chemicals that are in modern processing. But that waxy pectin leaves the final slab with authentic linen having this kind of spongier texture. And I think that helped to absorb some of the shock. So when you make this with ancient materials, it's actually a bit better protection than modern. Uh, we also did ones that were just sewn together, not glued. We also did ones that were quilted, where we stuffed between layers with wool or other substances. Uh, something that did not uh, work well was if you shoot it with a modern hunting arrowhead. This ripped right through it. And so technology does make a difference. Um, and you can see here clearly the difference between uh, modern carbon steel, which you can put a very, very fine edge on, and ancient bronze or iron, which are soft. And so they simply, you can't get as sharp an edge. So don't put on one of these, walk out in the woods in hunting season, think you're going to be safe. Uh, it, modern technology defeats this easily. In a lot of ways, this is like a classical equivalent of Kevlar. And it derives a lot of its power from the fact that when an arrow or anything hits it, the slab bends, it gives. And so it disseminates the incoming force, mass times velocity, over the entire surface. If you have bronze armor, all the force goes to a single point, And that one point has to stand up to all the incoming force. But because it has this kind of flex, that's what makes it strong. That's what makes it able to disseminate the force and serve as an effective form of armor. We also got our hands on some bronze plates uh, made by a blacksmith uh, according to sort of the same recipes that we think they used in ancient Greece. So we wanted to compare this to metal armor of the ancient world. Um, and we found that a 10 millimeter laminated linen slab was the equivalent in terms of protection of bronze that was two millimeters thick. And two millimeter bronze is the upper end. That's about the maximum that they made armor out of in the ancient world. So this is uh, up to the level of the best armor that the Greeks would have worn. So it really is decent protection. But even better, it weighs one-third the weight of bronze. So equal protection for one-third the weight. We also just hit it with anything we could find. Uh, I have a lot of weapons lying around my house, so we hit it with maces, with swords, spears, uh, axes, all kinds of things. And I can't really claim these tests were scientific, but they were interesting. Um, and it did prove very resistant. Uh, the guy with the axe almost killed himself here because it just bounced back. So because of that flex, uh, it was very good at defeating blunt force trauma. So yes, this might have broken your ribs, but it would, didn't even come close to getting through the armor. So it was saved your life. Finally, uh, as a final test, we thought, well, I suppose one of us should put this on and get shot. So Scott volunteered to do this, and here I have to do my serious warning do not, by any means, attempt this yourself. We are experts. <laughs> I, I, there is, I mean that sincerely. I mean, by this point, we had done about 1,300 test shots, and so I knew exactly how far this thing was going to go. Also, I've been shooting bows and arrows since I was a little kid, so this wasn't that irresponsible. So here I am, aiming at my student. Uh, you want to guess how this turned out? Well, sometimes things don't turn out as you hope. <laughs> 
No, he's kidding. Scott was fine. <laughs> so you can see it sticks very dramatically. It sticks very dramatically out of the armor, but he's completely unharmed. Uh, it doesn't penetrate, or only just the tiniest bit of the tip comes through. Uh, you can, as you can imagine, this is the shot all the documentaries wanted, so I ended up shooting Scott quite a few times. So uh, we, uh, we ended up having quite a few of these sort of real-life tests as well, which was kind of nice just to confirm that, yeah, it really works uh, when someone actually puts this on and gets shot by an arrow. All right, so what can we conclude from all this? Well, first of all, uh, the line of thorax uh, not only seems to be an effective form of protection, it actually seems to have some advantages over comparable metal armor. Uh, among these are the fact that it's cooler. Uh, and in the Mediterranean basin, if any of you have ever been there in August, you'll know it's hot. If you're wearing bronze armor, you basically get cooked. But linen is nice. It's light. It's breathable. And so soldiers wearing this would have gotten fatigued much more uh, slowly. They could have marched further. They could have fought longer. Uh, this may be why Alexander managed to march all the way to India. Um, his guys were wearing these nice sort of linen armor. It's also lighter. So like I said, the kind of rule of thumb is uh, compared to bronze armor that offers the same protection, the linen armor is somewhere between 30 and 50% of the weight of the bronze armor. So at least half as light, sometimes a third as light. It gets stronger when wet. Uh, this does raise the issue, though, of waterproofing. Uh, if you use a water-soluble glue, and rabbit glue is water-soluble, you need to waterproof it. Uh, I do think in the ancient world they had waterproof sort of super glues, but that's not what we were using. We did experiment with some forms of waterproofing. Uh, we tried various kind of, again, substances that were widely available, pine resin, uh, lanolin, beeswax. We made little test squares. We subjected these to a simulated 12-hour hard rain. That's using a sprinkler. Uh, and then we immersed them after that rain in buckets of water for a further four hours. So this was a pretty rigorous test. And what we discovered is that beeswax is actually pretty effective. So you don't even have to melt it. If you just take a block of beeswax and rub it uh, on the armor, uh, it'll make it not entirely waterproof, but highly water resistant. And we found that even if it comes delaminated in the water, if you just let it dry, it dries just fine. Uh, you have to renew the beeswax. So kind of like uh, you would have to polish metal armor to keep rust off, you would need to re-rub the beeswax every month or two. Um, one nice side effect is this, it makes your armor smell good. Uh, and in a world uh, without deodorant, uh, this was maybe no small consideration. So uh, that might have been quite a, a nice secondary effect of the waterproofing with beeswax. Uh, another big advantage is this uses common material and skills. So if you're making bronze armor, you need a blacksmith, a highly trained professional, and you need lots of rare and expensive metals. So you have to obtain these. Some of these things are not even found in a lot of regions in the Mediterranean. On the other hand, the line of thorax could have been made by almost any woman or girl in the ancient world. So uh, women were the ones who did a lot of the sewing, spinning, and weaving. Most households, the female members of the household, spent a lot of their time in fabric production. So I can easily imagine in a farmhouse uh, a mother making this for her son, a wife making it for her husband, uh, all the members of a household sort of making this sort of armor at home for the men of the household. So it's much more common sort of materials and skills than other forms of armor. It's cheaper. Uh, obviously it's a lot cheaper than bronze, but I think it's even cheaper than things like leather. Um, we have things such as uh, Diocletian's Price Edict, which gives us the prices of various goods in the ancient world. Fine, high-quality linen is very expensive, but low-quality, coarse linen is cheap, cheaper even than the sort of leather you would use to make leather armor. So uh, this, again, would be a nice alternative. Finally, it's more comfortable. Uh, I've worn lots of armor <laughs> in my life, uh, and believe me, once you wear stiff metal for eight hours, your back is killing you. But one of the nice side effects of this is if you wear it for a while, your body heat actually kind of warms up the glue and it softens and it conforms yourself to your exact body. Um, this is by far the most comfortable armor I've ever worn. So that's a nice little perk as well. And finally, it's decent protection. 
So it offers a pretty good protection to the wearer. So uh, we're still continuing various aspects of this project, but the main thing is finished. Uh, last year, we uh, had our book actually come out on this. At first, I thought this would just be a little article, but it grew like everything else into an entire book. Um, I've got some copies if you want to look through these and see them. Uh, so this is nice. We've now published sort of one phase of our research. Uh, we have a website if you want to make one of these yourself. Uh, we have a pattern up there, and I, many people have. I've gotten lots of photos from uh, people who have made their own armor following our pattern on our website. Uh, I think I'll stop there. I'll take a few questions, and then once that is over, I'll invite you to come up and have a look at some of the materials. So thank you. Yes? Did Scott get a passing grade? Did Scott get a passing grade? One of the remarkable things about this is this was a project done entirely outside of class. And all of those students, and they did a lot of the labor for this, uh, voluntarily contributed all their labor just for the fun of the project. Uh, though on the other hand, when you tell a student, you know, you can participate in a serious research project and it involves hitting something with an ax, uh, you might get more volunteers than other forms of research. But uh, it, it was fun to work with the undergraduates on this. I, I was very pleased by that. Yeah, that's a good question. So why did they stop using this? Um, if it's so great, as I've just said, why isn't it still used, or why was it not used in even the Roman era? And I think there's a couple answers to that. One is uh, it falls out of use about the time the Romans come in and take over everything. And partially, the Romans just had their own traditions of what their armor looked like. Early in Roman history, they used this too. In the Punic Wars, they used this. But by later, they start to have their metal armor, their sort of semi-steel armor. And the Romans were very keen on being Roman. They didn't want to look like Greeks. They didn't want to look like anyone else. And the more practical reason is that along with Roman technology, they have, first of all, they switch from bronze to what really does start to approximate steel. It's not true steel, but it's similar. And their arrowheads are also made out of that material. And you can put a sharper edge on those arrowheads, and they can start to penetrate this more readily. So it's not as good protection once we get into the Roman era. Um, also, once you get a little a couple hundred years later in time, you start to have people showing up with more powerful bows. So like Huns come in from the steppes. They have much more powerful bows than the Persians had. So at the same time that arrows are starting to be able to go through it more readily, bows are getting more powerful. It just isn't as good on the battlefield. What's interesting is we do have a couple Roman sources that say people would still wear these things when they went hunting. So it's a kind of nice light armor that you would wear, you know, not in a military context, but when you need a little bit of protection. There's even a reference to an emperor who was worried about assassination wearing one of these under his toga as a kind of, you know, bulletproof vest to prevent knife stabbing. So I think it was still around, but it's no longer, you know, first rank military equipment. So that's the answer to that. Yes. Oh, well, I, I read ancient Greek and Latin and all that, so I did the translations. Yeah, if you're an ancient historian, you have to know, you have to be able to read seven or eight languages. That's, I can't speak seven or eight, but I can read lots of different languages. So, yeah, so I, I did that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, the standard Greek uh, leg protection from the knee to the ankle are greaves, which are usually thin pieces of bronze that you just bend around uh, the front of your leg. One of the things we start to suspect is that they made other types of armor using the same technology, but they haven't survived either. So I suspect greaves were also made out of this. I suspect helmets. We do have a reference to some helmets being made out of laminated linen. And I, I should mention that there are a couple fragments which have been found in tombs both in Greece and Italy, which are laminated linen. So we know that they use this technology. And the sort of things that you usually get in tombs are armor. So those are probably actually little bits of a line of thorax that most of it is rotted away, and we just have enough to tell, oh, here's seven or eight laminated layers of linen. We also know that they use that sort of lamination technology in other contexts in the ancient world. So for example, the masks that uh, actors wore in the Greek theater, um, there's a professor uh, on the East Coast who's currently doing research which just showed that those masks were made out of laminated linen. So uh, it seems this was something they used not just in war, but a, a lot of different contexts. And we do have some archaeological evidence where we've actually found these that we're almost certain came 
but we can't say exactly what that armor was. Yes? Um, well, this one we cheated on a bit, so it's not entirely that authentic linen. Um, and we really didn't make a full one out of the authentic linen because of the expense. But the test patches, and I brought one here, is all that uh, authentic linen. So where we're doing kind of the scientific penetration stuff, we did use that. And like this, this test patch here, uh, this is one of ours. I mean, this would be like six, seven hundred dollars. So uh, this is an expensive thing there. Yes. Uh, do you have any audio of your lectures or your book? I'm just going to turn this off. So okay. Can you guys still hear me? I'm pretty loud usually. Um, do I have any audio? I didn't seem to turn off. Give me a second. There. Yes. Um, no. Uh, I do also make courses with the teaching company, great courses. Some of you may have heard of them. Mm -hmm. um, and I have one that's on the whole history of the world up to 800 AD. So uh, if, if you're interested in some ancient stuff on audio, I do have that. I'm making some new courses with them. But this project specifically, no. There are on the website a couple of videos. Um, so uh, there's a really early one that was kind of crude, and then there's a later one, which is actually a documentary made by some Germans, and it's just the film footage without the German voiceover. But you can still see a lot of the construction, and you can see me shooting Scott and some other stuff. So if you check out the website, you can see some videos and see some other stuff there. Other questions? Yes. After your encounters with the History Channel, have you had invitations from Hollywood to get into the recreation aspects of this for their <laughs> movies? I haven't been a consultant on a movie. Um, I mean, I, like I said, I've done a bunch of documentaries. Um, I've had some other weird offers. They actually contacted me when they were making the video game Rome Total War II <laughs> and wanted me to be a consultant on that. But I turned it down for some other things. So, yeah, you, you get some odd ones. I, I was telling some people at dinner that the strange, I get strange emails. The weirdest one I've gotten was from a game designer who makes role playing games. And he wanted to know, he wanted to do a game that was a zombie apocalypse and wanted to know that would this arm, arm protect you from being bitten by a zombie? And I told him, yes, it would. So I believe he put it into that game. So uh, yeah, you get some weird things like that. Where did you find the zombie to try it out? <laughs> I haven't found a zombie. There is, there is, however, an ancient source which says that if you're going hunting and are hunting big cats like tigers or leopards, this is particularly effective armor against their teeth because the teeth get caught between the layers. So I actually cited that passage to the zombie guy who was very excited. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, I want to give people time to come play with the stuff. So uh, I invite you to come up, look at the armor. If any of you want to actually try it on, you can do that as well. I have some linen fabric samples, some other stuff. Thank you.